Hi, AP Psychos, and welcome back to our States of Consciousness unit. And today we're going to be focusing on sleep. So the goal of today is to talk about the biology of the sleep cycle, right? So how kind of sleep looks in your body and your brain, and then to discuss the importance of sleep for your physical and mental health. So before we move into talking about sleep, I want to discuss what controls your sleep, and this is your circadian rhythm. So your circadian rhythm is also known probably to you as a body clock, right? And it is a natural kind of internal clock that tells you when to wake up and when to fall asleep. And it is associated with the natural rotation of sunlight and night, you know, lack of sunlight kind of with the Earth's rotation, which is why it works on about 24 hours. And although we think about it a lot of times as our body clock, like, oh, I'm feeling tired, I'm feeling asleep, um, I'm feeling awake, like my body clock is off, this actually, your, your circadian rhythm actually controls over a hundred different biological processes, not just how alert or how, how sleepy you feel. Um, here's an example of like all different things that happen during your uh, 24 hour body clock. And there are different times of day where you are um, like have highs and lows or strengths um, or, you know, peaks or these kinds of things in different abilities because of this biological clock. So this circadian rhythm is actually activated by a part of the brain, right? And the part of the brain that activates our circadian rhythm or helps to regulate it is called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, and this is inside the hypothalamus, right? So the hypothalamus, remember we talk about the hypothalamus, controls the pituitary gland, so it, it's not surprising, right, that the hypothalamus in this instance is a part of what controls the production of melatonin, which is a hormone, right, and hormones work in the endocrine system. So what happens is the suprachiasmatic nucleus gets light from the eye and then it talks to the penile gland and the penile gland actually produces melatonin and that melatonin makes you feel tired or makes you feel awake. So in the morning when you wake up, you open your eyes, the sunlight comes in, right? It tells your penile gland to shut off the melatonin and then you feel more alert. This is why it's really important when you wake up to like turn the lights on. If there's not light daylight outside like this morning when I woke up, 6 a.m., not so much, right? Dark outside. So all the lights go on in my house to help kind of shut off that melatonin. Bright, like I said, brightness decreases your melatonin levels and darkness increases it, which is why it's also so important to sleep in a dark room, right? To have like blackout curtains or those kinds of things. Um, and you can, like I said, artificially manipulate this by like turning on the lights, um, you know, or having bright light kind of exposure, which is why I never really understand why teachers teach, you know, with the lights off. Like I, you guys are already sleep deprived as teenagers and then they turn all the lights off and there's something to help the, help the melatonin decrease and it's bad news. There are some different ways your circadian rhythm can be disrupted, right? So it is your body's internal clock. And like I said, it works on like this 24-hour rotation. But if you change that rotation, like you travel somewhere where it is nighttime there and daytime where you're from, then that can disrupt your circadian rhythm. And this is something we call jet lag, right? And eventually your circadian rhythm will adapt. But in the meantime, you feel really tired, fatigued. You know, it's difficult um, because you're, you're moving your body's natural clock. Another example of a disruption in this is that third shift works, like working the night shift. You know, obviously, if you're working at nighttime, your body's not sleeping. And although you can do some things to help, like make sure you sleep in a really dark room to kind of simulate nighttime when you do get home during the day, your body likes to work with the way that the, na the Earth's natural rotation is. And so even though you do all those things, you still can't really ever get rid of some of the negative effects of third shift work, which can be some of these um, effects of disruption, physical and mental fatigue, uh, prone to make mistakes, depression, irritability, um, having a hard time sleeping when you do get to sleep. Like I know myself, when we came back from Indonesia, uh, we were waking up at like 3, 3.30, 4 a.m. for like you know at least a week um, trying to like regulate our sleep cycles uh, well, now that we're back in the United States. Um, and there are some disorders that can throw up your circadian rhythms, uh, and we'll talk about those a little more in class. And then in addition to that, there are increased accidents on the job for that third shift work because of the mental and physical fatigue. Um, Chernobyl, that nuclear plant accident, like that happened on the night shift. It's one of the uh, more famous or infamous examples of uh, how third shift work accidents increase on that third shift. Okay, so moving from circadian rhythm into just specifically focusing about sleep. So like I said, your body has this 24-hour clock, this rhythm, uh, but your sleep also has a rhythm, and this is called the sleep cycle, and you cycle through this sleep cycle 
uh, every 60 to 90 minutes during your sleep. So you go through multiple sleep cycles during a night's rest. Um, the sleep cycle has five phases, and we can actually tell which phase you're in by looking at an EEG. So if you see this picture, you're kind of hooked up, and we can actually measure your brain waves, and each stage of sleep has a different brain wave. And so we know exactly what stage of sleep you're in, and then we can wake you up from that stage of sleep and talk to you um, and like figure out if you were dreaming, if you were not, what was going on, blah, blah, blah. We can deprive you of certain types of sleep by waking you up when you're in that stage of sleep, see the impacts it has. So being able to measure these brain waves is really important to our understanding of how each stage of sleep has different roles. Okay, so speaking of these stages, what do they look like? So the first stage is not a stage of sleep. It's the stage of being awake, and it's when you have beta waves. So that's kind of your baseline, what your brain waves look like when you're awake. As you start to drift into sleep, which for most people takes about 20 minutes, um, you start to move into these alpha waves. Uh, this is a lighter stage of sleep. You have these myoclonic jerks, right, that, that, like the twitches or whatever, and then you feel like you're falling. Yeah, you wake up. Um, and this also can cause sometimes sleep hallucinations, which I'll explain a little more in class. Uh, if you've ever had one of those, you know exactly what it is. Um, and it only lasts a few minutes, like 10 or so, before you move into the next stage of sleep. And this is where we have theta waves. There's two special kind of waves in this stage of sleep called sleep spindles and K-complexes. They look like this. So sleep spindles is like a burst of brain waves. And then K-complexes is like your first indication of kind of a slower brain wave. And if you see, it kind of mimics what happens when you move into stage three and four. Sleep talking is most likely to happen in stage two. So you're moving into a deeper level of sleep, but definitely not deep sleep at that time. Then you have stage three, four. Your brain or your brain, your book separates this into stage three and stage four, but now we've kind of like put it together as one because stage three was like really not different than four. And this is where we have slow waves or deep waves. Uh, sometimes we call stage three, four slow wave sleep or SWS, um, or we call it deep sleeping, the delta deep sleep. Those two help me remember the Ds, right? And it looks like these down here, right? This is the deepest stage of sleep very restorative, uh, hardest to wake someone up from. If you've ever taken a nap too long and you like wake up and you're like all like disoriented and like groggy, you've woken up at a stage four. During this stage, we have sleepwalking, bedwetting, and night terrors. And if you've got a good sleepwalking class, make sure, or sleepwalking story, make sure you bring it to class um, on Monday. The last stage of sleep um, is rapid eye movement. So this stage gets its own special name uh, that's not based on the name of the brain waves. Uh, and it is because literally when you, are in, when you are in REM sleep, your eyes are moving rapidly back and forth. And the naked eye can see this if you happen to catch somebody when they're in the REM stage. It is a paradox. Um, we call it paradoxical sleep because of what's happening in your body. Your heart rate, your blood pressure, your breathing are all increasing. Your brain mimics wakefulness. So the, the brain waves look very similar. Like if I go back real quickly, the brain waves look very similar in REM sleep as they do to awake sleep. Okay. So you've got like a lot of increase in things, like a lot of, you know, activity going on. But your body's really cool and evolution's amazing and you are actually paralyzed. So this is why you don't act out your dreams. Yes. Right. Okay. Yay. We don't want to act out our dreams. Think about that for a second, some things you've jumped about. No. So your body paralyzes itself during this REM sleep, which is where you have the most amount of dreams. So we found this out by waking up people when they're in REM, their brain waves. We wake them up and we ask what they're, what, what's going on and they're dreaming. More likely than when we wake them up during stages one through four, which we call non-REM. So there's like non-REM one through four and then REM. Uh, and REM is its special stage. And throughout the night, REM will increase, so you'll dream more later on, and stage four will decrease. Um, and so I'll show you a picture of that in one second. So like I said, if you look at this, this is called a hypnograph, and this is what your sleep cycle looks like. So you go one, two, three, four, three, two, REM. You don't go one, two, three, four, REM. So it's like down and up, down and up, like a, you know, going up and down stairs, okay? REM replaces stage one, okay? But if you look, look, st stage four, stage four, REM, REM, no stage four, more REM. So they are inversely related in the sleep cycle. So the question is, why do we have to sleep now? So we know what happens when you're sleeping. We know that you dream, but like, why? Like, what are we doing? Like, it seems like we're not doing anything. But yeah, your body is like just laying there, right? But your brain is doing so much and there's a lot of really important things in your body that your brain is helping your body do during sleep. So there's a few theories on uh, sleep in terms of like evolution that it's restorative. So there are some genes that only turn on during sleep and some tissues, muscles, 
um, you know, other things that are being kind of like restored, that are being replenished. Um, and we find that there's a lot of things that happen to your body if you don't sleep, um, like, you know, uh, different heart disease or diabetes, these kinds of things, which kind of prove that it can be restorative and helpful to help the body kind of regenerate and rest. Conservation, right? We also uh, conserve energy and calories while we're sleeping. Uh, but there's another theory that's kind of come out recently as, we, as we've been able to study the brain in more depth. And this is the idea that sleep is actually essential for processing of information during your day and for memory consolidation. So they find that your memories are actually better when you wake up after you've slept and gone through kind of that whole stage of sleep, okay? It's very important because most students are like, oh, I'm going to stay up all night and study. And I'm like, no. Go to bed, go to bed, go to bed, right? They literally, they do a test. They give people like some words to memorize. They have some sleep. They have some not sleep. And people who slept do better. Just sleeping, no practice, no anything. So your brain actually puts everything in order, gets rid of stuff it doesn't need. They find that neurons grow. They have neurogenesis, right? This like long-term potentiation, these kinds of things are happening during this time. And your creativity is increased. And one of the ways that we know that your REM and your slow wave sleep are so important kind of in this memory consolidation process is that if we deprive you of your REM sleep, so if we wake you up during REM every night like in a sleep lab, the next night you try to go to sleep you try to get into REM quicker and stay there longer. So the next night I have to wake you up even more to stop from REM and even more the next night, et cetera. And the same with that slow wave or stage four sleep. So like your brain needs those two stages for this memory processing consolidation. So I mentioned how it can be restorative, right? And how it's very important for like energy conservation and these kinds of things. And so we see these things happening in the health uh, impacts of sleep deprivation. So this is a cool graphic. It talks about just after one night versus after a while of sleep deprivation. Um, all kinds of terrible things start to happen to your body. You get sick. The, the cells that fight sickness are decreased. And this is bad for like things like the flu, but it's also bad for more serious things like cancer. Um, impaired concentration. So you get into more accidents because you um, cannot pay attention and you are not able to kind of gauge how tired you are. You actually can get fat from not sleeping, right? So the hunger hormone called leptin does not turn off if you don't sleep enough. So you crave like sugary carbohydrate food all day long and you never feel full. Um, and they find that uh, there is a link to cardiovascular disease and sleep. And there is an increase in uh, heart attacks the day after spring daylight savings where you lose an hour um, of sleep. And there's a decrease uh, in the fall one that's coming up where you gain an hour of sleep. So lots and lots and lots of big major health issues uh, that impact. And people who actually sleep less than like seven hours a night in general or throughout their lifespan actually have a shorter lifespan than those who sleep eight hours. So how much sleep do you need? Like I said, eight hours is a good measure, but it's not always the same. So newborns need 16 to 18 hours. They spend a lot of time in REM, like half right, of their sleep is in REM because of all the new stuff that they're learning. Think about, like, basically everything is new, right? Teenagers, you require more sleep than adults, but you are the second most sleep-deprived group. First most sleep-deprived group, parents of newborns. Second most sleep-deprived group, adolescents. You need nine and a half hours because there is a lot of stuff happening in your body, right? There's a lot of changes going on, and your body needs more sleep. But on top of that, your body actually is programmed to go to bed later and wake up later. Your circadian rhythm like shifts um, during your adolescent period. And this is why so many schools are now pushing back the start day because asking you to get up at 6.30 for school is like asking an adult to get up at 4.30 for work. Adults need about eight hours a day. Um, some people need less genetically, and we'll talk about those specialties. But in general, uh, you need eight hours, and you are not special for the most part, and you do not need less. You just have learned to deal with less by drinking more caffeine, which is not a solution. This is a little chart about how REM kind of changes throughout your lifespan, adults in REM versus babies, infants in REM. So what kind of things can affect your sleep in order to get better sleep? Like what kind of things are making it hard for you to fall asleep? Stress. You know you have a big test or something you're worried about, hard time falling asleep. I know Sundays for me tend to toss and turn thinking about the work. Temperature. It's better to sleep when it's cold, right? Everyone has kind of like a preference, but in general, 65 degrees is a good temperature for your body because they find that as your melatonin kicks in and your brain waves, your body temperature actually lowers naturally. Uh, light, right? Like we talk about the penile gland and the melatonin release. 
and noise. So yeah, sleep, you feel like you're like kind of dead to the world, but you're not. Like So there are deeper sleepers than others, but there are always things that will wake you up uh, in sleep and um, you are not kind of um, like, you know, dead to the noise in the world around you. There are some lifestyle things that can impact your sleep. So like working in your bed, like doing your homework in bed is terrible because you learn to associate your bed with stress from homework and then stress and sleep. It goes around and around, right? Um, exercise. So working out too close to going to bed uh, can impact your ability to fall asleep. And then another thing, another um, like lifestyle is people sometimes think that alcohol, because it's a depressant, um, if they have trouble falling asleep, they might drink a glass of wine um, or, you know, have an alcoholic beverage. And that is a depressant. So it does like slow down your nervous system, but it actually impacts your ability to get good sleep because it disrupts your REM. So while it may help you fall asleep kind of momentarily, it doesn't actually help you stay asleep and get good sleep. And then the last thing that could affect your sleep are sleep disorders. Um, and these are not generally things that you can control. Uh, you can do some things to kind of help. Uh, but we'll talk in more detail about each of these sleep disorders uh, in class. So that's all for now, AP Psychos. Get some rest this weekend. I'll see you on Monday. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.